Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You may have joined the presentation listening to your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. There are some handouts available for you to download during the live broadcast. If you would like to download them, then please locate them from the handouts section of the control panel. In today's webinar, we will cover the current status of elective orthopaedic surgery and the effects of the pandemic in the UK before we introduce the, the hemoclear sterile exsanguinating tourniquet. The main presentation will be done by Ross Munro and Noam Gavrili. For those of you who stay until the latter part of the webinar, we have a special offer, so stay tuned. We are delighted that OHK have joined us today. They have recently run a series of webinars much more specific and detailed that we can link you to um, if anyone is interested in any particular aspect of orthopaedic surgery in relation to hemoclear, then please let us know and we'll follow up with the details. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ross Munro. Um, Ross, over to you. Thanks, Jamie. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending the webinar this morning. My name is Ross Munro, and I'm the product specialist for Hemoclear in the UK. Also joining me today is Professor Noam Gavrielli. Noam, if you'd like to give yourself a quick introduction. Sure, Ross. It's always a pleasure, and welcome to everyone. Um, I uh, um, uh, have been uh, working as a professor of physiology uh, of the lung and the heart uh, for many years at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. I also practiced emergency medicine and intensive care medicine. And um, um, some years ago, I uh, um, uh, developed uh, uh, the hemoclear uh, which actually emerged from uh, an emergency medicine product um, intended for patients in shock, severe shock, and cardiac arrest. Very similar uh, uh, product to the Hemaclear. Um, uh, right now, I am the chief medical officer and CEO uh, of uh, the company that is producing uh, Hemaclear. And we are very proud and pleased to have Pentland um, uh, 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 distributing the product uh, in uh, the UK. So, Ross, back to you, and uh, um, uh, I hope everyone enjoys uh, this uh, learning opportunity. Thanks, Noam. I appreciate this morning we have a mixed audience in terms of specialities and levels, so subsequently we have tailored the content to the audience. If we could go to the next slide, please, Jamie. I want to start by looking at waiting lists, and as we all know, the NHS and healthcare systems globally have been under massive pressure over the past year due to the pandemic. Last March, when the severity of the pandemic became clear in the UK, the NHS cancelled elective procedures for a minimum of three months to free up capacity and staff to deal with COVID. This has had a substantial impact on waiting lists, which were already very high. The last figure published from NHS English was 4.5 million people waiting on an operation. This list continues to grow. Thankfully, from the autumn, the NHS restored approximately 80% of elective procedures, which, from what we can see, has remained fairly consistent despite a resurgence in COVID admissions during the winter months. But what does this mean specifically for orthopaedics? Next slide, please. <clears throat> the impact on orthopaedic surgery has been dramatic. A report in December 2020 from the BOA found that in total, between April and September 2020, 212,000 fewer operations occurred this year than in the same period in 2019. This is a reduction of 73%. In October 2020 in England, the number of patients admitted was 63% of normal compared to 2019. Now, this is the lowest of any surgical speciality. 
Waiting lists have increased correspondingly, and patients waiting 18 plus weeks at the end of October stood at 244,536, against just 100,000 at the start of 2020. The number of patients waiting over a year in NHS England was a modest 436. In January, that number was over 34,978. There has also been a reduction in referrals as people have avoided healthcare settings during the pandemic. Referral rates have not yet returned to pre-pandemic levels and stand between 65 and 70 per cent of their normal rates. From March to August 2020, there been, there was 614,000 uh, 614, fewer referrals to orthopaedics than the same period of 2019. Usually, a quarter of these would pre present for surgery. And while some may be managed effectively within primary and community care without referral, it is likely there will be a delay and surge of patients presenting in surgery in months and years to come. Next slide, please. I want to have a look at the current practice of using tourniquets. So the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery published a paper on injuries caused by pneumatic tourniquets and found over 63,484 procedures they monitored, 15 had injuries caused by a pneumatic tourniquet. 13 of these were a neuropraxia and reversed within six months. One was a paralysis and the other was a sensory deficit. This is on average from this sample size, a tourniquetal rated injury one in every 4,232 uses, which may seem very low, but when we compare it to Hemoclear, we have had none in over 1.5 million uses. Pneumatic tourniquet products also require calibration for accurate pressure performance, which can cause a negative impact if not properly maintained. There's also another thing. The image on the right hand side of this slide may be familiar to a few of you as a chemical bound. This is in fact a mechanical bound and is caused by prep getting under the tourniquet before it is inflated. Once the tourniquet inflates, the pinch points of the tourniquet grab the skin and cause blistering. This can cause great discomfort to the patient or worse, an infection. We never see this with Hemoclear. So what is Hemoclear? Next slide, please. Hemoclear is an exsanguination tourniquet that comes in a range of sizes. The size is selected according to the circumference of the patient's limb, and it ranges from 14 centimetre circumference limbs in uh, infant surgeries, all the way to 85 centimetre circumference, which will cover larger obese adult knee procedures, and all in between. The product is very simple to use, but will require some training. This video shows the application of the upper limb medium size yellow team hemoclear and walks step by step through the correct way to select size and apply the product. If you could play the video, please. Thank you for tuning in to the Hemoclear Training Center. In this short video, we'll discuss the proper application of Hemoclear. Today, we will discuss the application of the Hemoclear Yellow to the upper extremity. Once the proper size Hemoclear has been determined, open the sterile packaging, introducing Hemoclear to the surgical field. Note that the packaging is dual peel packed. Be sure to save the Hemoclear cutting card for the end of the procedure. You are now ready to apply the Hemoclear onto the patient. Take notice that the patient is prepped very proximally. To apply Hemoclear, have your assistant grab the patient's hand from the palm side, capturing all the fingers together. Next, the surgeon should hold the handles of the Hemoclear medial lateral or east-west. All fingers should be placed within the Hemoclear device. Pulling the handles towards the patient, advance Hemoclear to the mid-hand. Have your assistant grab the top of the hand and pull to provide axial traction for the application. Continue advancing Hemoclear by pulling the handles towards the patient's chest. As straps become longer, simply wrap the excess material around your hands to increase leverage and avoid leaving the sterile field. The tourniquet is now up. Dictate the tourniquet time. Once Hemoclear has reached the desired occlusion location and tourniquet time has been recorded, wrap and tie the straps distal to the Hemoclear ring. If rollback is not a concern, simply cut the ribbons off. Now that your Hemoclear is applied, simply expose the surgical area. 
You can either expose the desired surgical area or remove the entire Hemoclear stockinette. You are now ready to begin your procedure. When you would like to remove Hemoclear, place the Hemoclear cutting card from the distal side of the ring under the Hemoclear. Utilizing a knife, cut the ring in slow, orderly passes. Once you are through the internal silicone ring, you can utilize scissors to remove the rest of the device. Your tourniquet is now down. Note the tourniquet time. Thank you for tuning in to this Hemoclear training segment. If you have any questions on the reviewed material, please contact us or your local product specialist. Thanks, Jamie. As you can see in the video, once the correct size was chosen, the product took two people to apply correctly. And this would be the last step taken before putting knife to skin and starting the procedure as this product is supplied dual peel packed and sterile. Using Hemoclear reduces equipment footprint in the operating theatre and there are no mechanical parts that can fail or go wrong during the procedure or after. It reduces cleaning time for nursing staff and costly theatre time overall. You can go to the next slide, please. Hemoclear is exclusively sterile and single use, and included in today's handout section is a paper by Simon Thompson, who is a knee surgeon based in London. In the paper, he compares reusable pneumatic tourniquets and Hemoclear using swab testing. The results highlight the contaminated pneumatic tourniquet levels, and some of the bacteria present may come as a surprise, particularly when we consider that this is the only non-sterile product used within the sterile field. This can lead to significant long-term cost savings, as one surgical site infection can cost the same as up to 1,000 units of Hemoclear. Also in today's handout section is a published paper from Peter Kempshaw, who is a knee surgeon based in Gloucester. This paper highlights the increased operating field due to the narrow band of the Hemoclear. This results in more operating room than would be possible with a wide pneumatic tourniquet. This can example be particularly useful in paediatric surgery, where we might not have a pneumatic tourniquet size that fits the limb, or a procedure such as a knee revision where you need higher access. This short video shows Riddy and Morgan Jones, one of our valued customers at the Spire Cardiff Hospital, using the Hemoclear on a knee revision case on a conical shaped thigh. If you could play the video again, please, Jamie. Good morning, uh, Andrew Bob and Jones, uh, orthopedic surgeon, knee specialist here in Cardiff. Uh, we're at the Spire Cardiff Hospital this morning and we've just finished a uh, case using Hemoclear. We've been using Hemoclear for the last two and a half to three years and it's been a major plus for my practice, in particular vision knee surgery and uh, the ability to use a sterile single use tourniquet, which gives me excellent uh, examination but also gives me a very large sterile field. So I'm doing an extensive approach for a vision in particular. I have no fear of uh, running out of space, hitting an external tourniquet, decontaminating the field. The uh, my initial reason for using it was uh, the fact that it was single use, uh, but having started to use it, uh, the added advantage of having a large sterile field, uh, predictable examination, and really uh, zero complications to date, it's been very, very impressive. The, the staff having been very uh, cynical to start with, because anything new, obviously, they, uh, they're a little bit in question. But within one or two uses, they can all see the advantage and uh, they understand when the tonic goes on, it, it will work, it's predictable and it, you know, it's just very, very simple and the guys all like it. To date, we haven't had any pain issues, we haven't had any skin issues, we haven't had any neurovascular issues, uh, which worries me. We should have some complications somewhere, but we haven't seen any. And, um, uh, and these are cases where I've used the tonic to two hours time, uh, length, no complications. You know, I try and keep all my operations to the minimum tourniquet time. And the fact that we can prep and drape the skin to start saves us a few minutes, tourniquet goes on, and I provide after my planning properly, the operation should go smoothly. So we're aiming an hour and a half to two hours maximum for revision. And at that level, there's no complication at all that I see using nuclear. Thank you, Rydian. As you can see there, Ridian's gloves were completely dry. And this is down to the fact that Hemoclear exsanguates 95% of the blood. If you compare this to other techniques such as limb elevation or the use of a re exsanguinator, 
is far superior and it gives the surgeon greater hemostasis over a larger area. Uh, for example, an upper limb surgeon can perform above elbow procedures with a completely bloodless surgical field. If we can go to the next slide, please, Jamie. So how can Hemoclear help now and the post-pandemic? Hemoclear is already helping in some situations in the UK. For example, we have seen an increase in the sales of uh, the hand version, the Model F, as consultants have moved procedures such as uh, trigger finger release, carpal tunnel, to the office type environments out, out of theatres. <clears throat> and as Hemoclear doesn't require any machinery and is found to be more tolerable than an aromatic tourniquet, they're more than happy to do this. But it's at this stage where I'd like to invite my colleague, Professor Gabrielli, to talk about how he thinks Hemoclear can save time, specifically in the operating theatre uh, and perhaps post-operation. So, Noam, over to you. You're on mute. <laughs> yeah, I'm not on mute anymore. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm honoured to be considered as a colleague uh, to Ross Monroe. Um, uh, this is uh, very nice. So, uh, the issue of time saving uh, is a big, uh, a big issue uh, these days. I want to talk about two times, two types of of time saving. Uh, overall uh, operating room time saving and tunica time saving. First, tunica time saving. Tunica time is uh, important in cutting down uh, the um, uh, complications. The longer tunica time, the higher the rate of infection, the higher the chances of uh, blood loss, uh, the higher the pain and skin injury. So cutting down tunica time is important. Now, imagine that a non-sterile non pneumatic tunica is used. The common practice is to exsanguinate, typically in a non-sterile technique by limb elevation or the wrist davis device, inflate the tunica, and then you start the prepping and the draping. Prepping and draping can be anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes until uh, everything is ready for the surgeon to start. This time is added to the entire tunica time and um, uh, is, is uh, wasteful. Hemoclear, on the other hand, is the last thing to be placed, as you saw very clearly in the Morgan Johns video. It is placed on the uh, limb by the surgeon. That means the surgeon is already in the room. It is placed relatively quickly. We don't like it to be put on too quickly because we are shifting quite a bit of blood from the limb to central circulation, and we never want the blood pressure to go up. So we bring it up slowly over uh, uh, 10, 15, 20 seconds. Uh, and, uh, and, um, but nevertheless, the whole process is saving a lot of tunica time. Now, in addition to that, using a device that is um, uh, giving you a, a completely dry field means that you don't waste time on uh, um, um, uh, 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 cutting down on bleeding, on hem hemostasis, and so on. Uh, surgeons don't use the cautery device, um, and often, uh, unless they need it for cutting, uh, they don't even touch it. So uh, the cautery pen can be put on standby in many operations, no need to open it for every case. Uh, using suction is minimized. The suction is um, a source of infection. Uh, it gives something for the assistants to do, but it really is uh, 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 not a good thing to waste time on. 
Uh, pulse lavage, for example, is another source of potential introduction of infected particles into the uh, incision. All of that is not necessary when you use Hemaclear that gives you a completely dry uh, surgical field. The last, uh, uh, I'd say, um, uh, uh, time saving is at the end of surgery. At the end of surgery, uh, uh, as you saw in the Morgan Johns video, uh, instead of wasting time again on hemostasis after letting down the pressure with the pneumatic tunica, uh, many, I would say maybe most surgeons, first suture in layers, close the skin, put a nice uh, tight uh, Johns dressing, and only then cut the hemaclear ring. Uh, this again saves minutes, minutes from the operating uh, time. When you talk about the overall OR usage time, look at the number of items that you need to prepare uh, for surgery with the nomadic tunica. The nurse has to uh, find and uh, the right size of uh, uh, the cuff, uh, perhaps clean it once more, uh, need to uh, bring uh, an s mark bandage, sometimes two if the patient is obese, uh, need to check the pump, need to check the, uh, the uh, tubings, need to provide stockinette and padding. Uh, so we have uh, a, an involved process with quite a bit of clutter and running around. This is all uh, uh, eliminated with using the Hemaclear, which is just a single product, uh, does not need any power source, does not need any manning, does not need to wait for the guy who knows how to uh, play with the dials, who has just been out for lunch. Uh, it is uh, um, uh, all in the control of the surgeon and the staff. And the result is that uh, a tangible uh, 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 amount of time can be saved to increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of uh, operating room uh, utilization. Um, so um, there may be some other aspects that uh, I uh, uh, neglected to tell you about, but uh, there will be more webinars in the future. Thank you, Ross. No problem. Um, thanks, Rat Noam. I suppose the other question that comes up just about every time we go to do a trial of this product is the worry of using a narrow cuff versus a wide pneumatic cuff. Uh, I think um, pneumatic tunicase, it's the wider, the better, the less risk of causing damage. Um, and that's often the biggest concern of surgeons. I'm sure you've been asked this question a million times, but what answer do you give to consultants who, who are concerned about trying it because of the localized pressure caused by the narrow band? Sure. Um, uh, you're right, uh, Ross. I've been asked this question a million times. Uh, every surgeon who starts uh, asks a question about it. But we have to be correct. You are not applying pressure to a narrow, you're applying a force to a narrow area. So uh, uh, everyone remembers from high school uh, that uh, uh, pressure is a force divided by area. And if the area is smaller in order to achieve the same pressure and the hemaclear achieves the same pressure, uh, the force that is needed is much less. In fact, it's seven times less than with the pneumatic tunica. So uh, with the pneumatic tunica, a huge amount of force is applied to the circumference of the leg. There is absolutely no need to apply pressure over a wide area uh, in order to block an artery. Uh, everyone who uh, has uh, uh, played with the radial pulse knows that you can occlude the radial artery just with one finger. That's all. 
and you don't need to compress it over a long range, a longer uh, stretch of the uh, artery. Finally, uh, a study done actually in the UK in the early 1970 um, by Ochoa. Uh, clearly showed and, and said so that the wide tourniquet causes compression of the nerves, okay, compression of the nerves, and as a result, there is elongation of the nerve, which telescopes into itself at uh, one edge or another edge of the pneumatic tourniquet. The result is disruption of the axon and nerve damage. As Ross has said, in more than one and a half million cases, we did not have any uh, case of nerve damage uh, using uh, hemaclear, and we attribute it to the uh, hemaclear. The uh, narrow band of the hemaclear allows us to place it in strategic places such as 10 centimeters above the ankle uh, bone in the uh, lower foot. It's not painful there. It, is, uh, uh, it can be placed in the upper thigh all the way up to the groin, like we saw in the video. That has many, many advantages. The same is placing it here on the forearm for all cases of the hand. Uh, and that again is it's 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 uh, not painful at all to have it here, and placing it in the upper arm for uh, cases involving the um, elbow and above the elbow, so those can be done bloodlessly. Bottom line is we apply force to an uh, a smaller area to achieve the same pressure achieved with the nomadic tourniquet enough to block the blood flow but not much to cause uh, soft tissue or nerve damage thank you noah um <clears throat> Voss is another paper there with uh post-operative pain and how hemoclear can reduce that but that that's maybe a topic for another day because we could talk um all day long about that i'm i'm conscious we have some questions from the audience as well so jamie if you want to come back on the screen and um, maybe put them towards us. Uh, yeah, yes, th thanks Ross. We, we do have a, a couple of questions um, that, that have come in so far and obviously the, the audience can continue uh, to submit any questions. Um, before we go to the to the live Q and A session, um, you know we'd like to thank you all for staying tuned. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, we have a, a special offer for viewers of this webinar. Um, so for first-time users, we're offering a, a free, fully supported trial um, of of Hemaclear, you know, at, at a convenient time given the current restrictions, uh, and also a, a, an ex we'll extend a one-time 20% discount to any new or existing customers uh, of Hemaclear who who quote the code on, on screen at the moment. Discover Hemaclear. Um, so we're now going to begin answering some questions that were. That have been submitted already. Um, as I said, you can continue to submit questions through the questions pane uh, in your attendee control panel. So our, our first question here is okay. For, from uh, th this one's from Marku. Is there a lot of rollback um, with an extremely conical shaped thigh um, if you were using like a, a larger hemoclear? Um, so the answer directly to that is no. Uh, the silicon ring inside the hemoclear locks where once uh, every 180 degrees. Um, if rollback is still a concern from there, we see in the Ridley and Morgan Jones video or the training video that you can tie the ribbons round and tie further. It just gives you an extra guard, extra guard from rollback. So it's not a concern for us at all. Okay, um, next one I have here is just from Jackie, which is just asking for the, the PowerPoint presentation, just, just to let everybody know that they will receive the recording of this webinar automatically, and we'll follow up with, with the slides as well, if, if you're interested to see them. Um, so the next one is from Andrew. Um, he's asking, is it safe to use in small children or babies? What What is the age or you know size limit? 
Okay, uh, yes, it is uh, safe. Uh, we have um, uh, 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 cases of uh, babies uh, uh, a month old um, uh, 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 or less, uh, um, uh, typically for uh, um, malformations, uh, congenital malformation. Uh, it is used uh, for uh, all children um uh and it's very safe very delicate on the skin no no injury no abrasions or injuries uh to the skin uh, uh of course the narrow ring is uh, helpful because children uh, by default are small and the real estate is is less uh so there are many advantages of using it uh in children uh, if you have two teams and you're trying to cut down on anesthesia time and work simultaneously, most uh, ORs don't have uh, two uh, pneumatic uh, uh, pumps, so you can easily use a uh, hemoclear on both uh, uh, legs and work with two teams at the same time. So yes, it is absolutely safe to be used in uh, children including in osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, where the bone is brittle. Uh, of course, you need to apply axial uh, tension like uh, you do when you have a fracture. OK, thanks. I guess it kind of leads on to, to the next question I have here from Helen, um, which is asking a bit more about the, the size ranges um, of hemoclear. You know, what, what are the size you know, what, what do we have to, to cover each size of patient, um, upper and lower limb, obviously? Um, Ross or Norm, could you, could you give a little bit more detail on that? Sure. Um, so the hemoclear small um, uh, code pink uh, starts at 14 centimeters. This is about 14 centimeters. Uh, it's, it's very small. And we um, 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 we have four basic sizes: four uh, small, medium, large, and extra large. Extra large is covering anywhere from 50 to 85 centimeters, which is about 95 percent of adult uh, population. So um, um, uh, uh, in, in the leg, of course. Uh, when you're ready to order, your um, 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 uh, Pentland representative will be more than happy to guide you on what is needed uh, in order to uh, get started in the particular cases that you want to use Hemaclear on. Yeah, I think that's uh, the only time I've um, seen Hemaclear not being able to fit a patient was uh, a Marine who had extremely large uh quadricep muscles so um i think every other case we've managed to to have a size that fits okay and, and i guess this leads on quite nicely to, to the next question i have here as well which is all about the the pressure and um, how how would we record the pressure for any given patient given that everyone is a, a different different size um yeah how, how do we do that so okay. i'll Go for the easy option here, Noam, and then you can maybe go for the, the little bit more detailed version. You mean, um, you mean no, no differential equations? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, good. Um, so, uh, technically, you need to measure the circumference of the limb at the site where you want to park the hemaclear ring and the distance from the fingers or from the toes. With these two measurements, you go in a lookup table, which is uh, in uh, every uh, user guide and also uh, the posters, small posters that are available for the OR uh, uh, to place on the wall. And um, you get the exact uh, pressure on the skin. Uh, this is uh, how you determine the pressure. That is the pressure that you record in the patient's uh, chart. If anyone is interested in uh, the more basic knowledge of uh, how the pressure is determined, why the pressure is relatively constant as you change uh, circumference, it's not exactly constant, but relatively constant, or uh, if you want to understand the difference between skin pressure and internal pressure, 
then we can uh, 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 you can be invited to ask to be invited to one of the general webinars uh, that the company is providing. It will be in two months uh, that will discuss the biomechanics of tunicates. Uh, and I always go with the easy answer with that um, when I'm in operating theatres is every single packet has a median device pressure. And usually that's enough for nursing staff to, to write down. Most people are happy with that pressure. Uh, and I would point that out to you, of course, if I came in to do, to do any trials. So, yeah, that's the easy answer for, from my point of view. OK, um, next question. Um... Again, from Andrew, um, what is your recommendation for use in tumour surgery of uh, infected cases? Is there a risk of spread? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, hemoglobin is used extensively in trauma. Um, uh, one of the first users uh, were by um, uh, Dr. Uh, Jupiter, who uh, realised that if he wants to fix a uh, humerus fracture, even mid shaft or even proximal, uh, uh, using hemocure is basically the only option for doing it as a bloodless uh, operation. But a couple of things to remember. One, uh, you need to apply axial traction when bringing the hemocure on the limb. Somebody has to apply axial traction so that the broken uh, limb does not buckle. Um, Second, um, always look for deep vein thrombosis uh, when working uh, uh, on uh, patients with fractures, legs or, or uh, upper. Um, patients assume that any patient with uh, more than 12 hours from the time of injury uh, may have deep vein thrombosis. So that has to be excluded um, either by um, doing a, a, a duplex uh, Doppler or clinical examination or any other. Uh, so that's number um, uh, uh, two. Um, uh, and um, uh, again, it it's, it's, uh, gives you a much larger field, especially in cases where you need to extend the incision, it is sterile, it is cutting down on infection. So yes, it is used extensively in uh, trauma. Just to, to clarify something on, on that point, Norma, I think that the question related more to tumor surgery. So if there was a tumor. Um, oh, and is, is, oh, oh. <laughs> but I oh, think uh, the, the trauma subject was also highly relevant. So, um, but yeah. I, I, if we could, yeah. Uh, is, is, there a risk of, uh, is there a risk of spread with infected cases? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, malignant tumor uh, is a contraindication for using SMARC or Hemaclear. Um, uh, that's clear. If you know, uh, and the same is also uh, with, with infection. If you have a pocket of pus in the limb, uh, please don't uh, squeeze it into central circulation. It is not recommended. Uh, if you know that the tumor is benign, uh, there is absolutely no problem using uh, hemoclear, uh, move, passing it over the tumor, um, uh, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. So um, uh, yes, but but uh, malignancy is 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 an absolute contraindication in our view. You got two for one there, yeah. Uh, so there's nothing else to add add to that for me. We would highlight the contraindications when we came in um, to all surgeons anyway, because it's it's important that the product's not used. Um, it can cause serious problems if it, if it is used in an incorrect manner. So, okay. Um, Ross, the next one uh, comes from David. It's it kind of you, you did touch on it a little bit uh, towards the end of your talk there, but that was uh, really about the, the post-operative pain. Uh, compared to a pneumatic tourniquet, I mean, is, is there anything to sort of prove that, that hemoclear would be um, a better option in terms of post-operative pain than a, than a wider pneumatic tourniquet? Yes. Um, if you take the details as well, I can send a paper that we have sure. um, that was done in Turkey. Um, it was quite, I um, can't remember the sample size of it. Maybe Noam remembers the sample size. It was quite a substantial study. 
um, um, yeah. the pain the pain recorded. So, uh, we have several studies now that uh, looked at pain um, as, uh, as, a, as a, a, a quantitative parameter. And um, uh, the, the uh, Ankara study, which had um, uh, uh, 500 patients uh, with bilateral knee replacement, um, uh, and uh, they showed significantly less uh, uh, pain. Another more recent study was uh, published um, about, uh, um, and they uh, looked uh, specifically at pain and skin injury. That's a study um, um, uh, of, uh, uh, again, it's a fairly large uh, study. It's 50 patients with bilateral knee, one knee done with hemoclear, one knee done with pneumatic tunicate. So they asked the patient uh, about the pain in one leg and the other leg. And again, there was a very significant uh, difference in pain. Uh, re regarding skin injury, uh, there was uh, no skin injury on the hemoclear side. Uh, there were 10 patients with skin issues in the 50 patients, in the 50 legs that uh, were done uh, with uh, pneumatic. Uh, again, we can talk about the mechanics of that, but we will do it in a separate uh, webinar. There is a reason for that. It's not uh, um, uh, it's not by by uh, 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 miracle. Um, and talk to patients and talk to uh, physical therapists, the and nurses. The patients are willing to get out of bed and start ambulating when hemoclear is used for, let's say, knee replacement or knee arthroscopy, much more readily than when they have a pneumatic tourniquet. So um, uh, uh, talking to patients, talking to the immediate caregiver uh, in the uh, department or at home uh, will reveal the actual fact uh, about the uh, pain. Okay, um, we're almost coming to the end of the, the questions that, that have been submitted. There's just one sort of on a more general level, um, and that is, you know, when we're using a, a pneumatic tourniquet, obviously the, the maximum length of time that can go is two hours, uh, which you know, which we assume is the same with hemoclear. So how how would we treat that? Obviously, because hemoclear is single use, how how would we work around that? Uh two hours, we don't like uh, doctors, uh, surgeons to go over two hours. Um, sometimes you need to go over two hours. And the company policy is very clear. Remove at two hours, wait 10, 15, 20 minutes, apply a second one, and send uh, uh, um, an email, a fax, a pigeon, whatever, to the Pentland uh, group, they will bring you a replacement free of charge. We just don't want you to worry about it, to try to save money to the institution or whatever. So respect the two hours and uh, it is on us. Uh, don't worry about it. Okay, I have nothing to add. <laughs> Okay, a uh, final question that I have then that just came in. Um, is it safe to use in peripheral vascular disease? Okay, um, so the, the peripheral vascular disease is not a contraindication. Um, um, in fact, these patients are used to being without too much blood in their legs. My personal recommendation is that because these patients don't have a huge reserve of oxygen or oxygen carrying molecules in their limb is to try to limit the duration of the operation. But the rule is very simple. Use it if you use, if you consider using pneumatic tunica. Don't use it if you are not considering using a pneumatic tunica. It's a clinical judgment. It depends on the patient, on the condition, on the uh, type of uh, uh, surgery, etc. I can tell you that, for example, foot and ankle surgeons 
who uh, 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 work with diabetes patients, they love the Hemaclear. One other thing, because of the nature of the device and its narrow ring, uh, it can be placed on the lower leg, on the ankle, for all foot surgery. So whereas now you put the pneumatic tunica up in the thigh or mid thigh, and you uh, uh, occlude the blood flow to uh, um, a whole big chunk of, of, of tissue, uh, you can minimize the amount of tissue under ischemic condition by using uh, hemaclear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There's been another couple come in uh, just when, when one was answering that. So th this one, uh, I'm surprised it's not come up uh, before now, but uh, as with most hospitals, we struggle with convincing managers about costs. Um, how much does a, each piece cost? Um, and I guess, you know, how, how, how could it be justified? How have other UK hospitals justified that cost? Ross, could you give us? I mean, to, just to touch on the, 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 the price, I mean, we, we can certainly follow up with that information. It does obviously vary depending on the, the application, the, the, the size um, that you're looking for, um, but we, we'll follow up with, with that information. But Ross, uh, maybe you could give some information on, on how other UK NHS hospitals have gone about justifying that cost. Yeah. Um, Still, so yeah. Obviously, the NHS is, is very cost driven. Um, I would say most centres, in fact, probably ninety percent, I guess, have started using this product selectively. So they either use it on a selective group of patients, i.e., uh, they maybe use it for obese patients only because pneumatic tunicates don't work on this group or they'll start using it for paediatric surgery um, or a specific type of procedure, like uh, an above elbow procedure where they can't get access. Um, that's probably the way they start to use it. And then once it's on the shelf, they find reasons more and more to use it because they, they generally gain to like it. In terms of cost justification, um, there's no capital equipment attached to it on the outset. So there's no uh, initial outlay for capital equipment. There's no maintenance costs. It's a completely single use product. Um, the, the, the product is probably, depending on what you're currently using, is probably going to be, when it's compared directly, slightly higher in cost, but there's numerous clinical advantages. Um, and generally we can get around them. Um, it, it takes a bit of time with, with anything in NHS, but we can get around them. Um, and if, if we can prove the clinical argument enough, that which we've not failed to do so far. Uh, Ross, you are absolutely right, and, and uh, you summarized it uh, very concisely. Uh, um, the NHS is a particularly good environment, whereas in other countries, uh, the budget of the operating room is dealt with separately from the budget of the entire hospital so that uh, cost or cost savings um, in the, uh, um, uh, on the entire case, for example, by cutting down infection or cutting down blood transfusion or cutting down on hospital days, um, which go into the overall budget of the hospital. Um, um, uh, in other countries, uh, the OR, may not see it. They only see the increased uh, cost when you compare hemaclear, sterile hemaclear, to non-sterile pneumatic tunica that in their mind cost nothing. The NHS environment and other countries where there's sort of social medicine, where you look at the entire case as a holistic uh, budget item, uh, you can easily see that the the savings on cutting down complication is uh, very uh, significant. Uh, there's actually a paper, uh, the French paper, uh, discusses uh, that uh, issue very uh, clearly and with numbers. Yeah. Th thanks, Noam. Um, I guess I would just add to that, um, in the, the current climate, um, obviously uh, with COVID, we have seen a, a bit more 
we've sort of cut through the procurement processes a little bit quicker than we might, we might normally have uh, just because uh, theatres are looking to reduce the amount of equipment that they have uh, such as the pneumatic tourniquet machine um you know just to to reduce the risk of infection and um, reduce theater time i think ross you touched on it in your presentation how um some procedures are moving out of the theater into like a more like a procedure room um, and hemoclear works very well in that environment as well so yeah um th th that's all i would add on on that point um just now uh, we do have one final uh question um and that is how about in isolated limb perfusion can we use that as well? Uh, okay, isolated limb perfusion is used uh, uh, as a, a, I'd say, heroic treatment of uh, certain cancers of the uh, um, uh, of the limbs. Um, uh, Hemoclear can be used; has been used. It requires a certain attention to the insertion. Uh, of the uh, cannula and um, uh, so on. Um, the the um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, advantage is the, the highest risk with isolated limb perfusion is uh, that when we, the the oncologist uh, puts the, the bad poisons into the veins uh, of uh, the limb. Um, the highest risk is that the pressure of the tourniquet may fall down and that crud will uh, spread in the entire uh, body and, and the patient can easily die from it. Uh, clear it will never happen, okay? Uh, so if you're planning uh, ahead, uh, you can keep the clear for two hours uh, you can calculate the concentrations that you need. It's a very interesting application. It's a, it's a procedure randomly used. In fact, um, 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 uh, the, the, there was an attempt to use it on horses uh, in the UK um, in order to inject um, high concentration of antibiotics into um, a lower leg of a horse. A horse is big. If you want to give high dose antibiotics, you need about a barrel of it, expensive. So you, you block uh, the circulation, you inject the um, uh, uh, antibiotic into the uh, uh, vein, you wait for an hour, and then you remove it. By that time, the antibiotics has uh, uh, been absorbed into the tissue. So um, I don't know how much of that. We are not so active in the orthopedics, uh, in the uh, veterinary area, but I think it is uh, actually a very interesting application. Uh, people are very imaginative. So um, uh, I thought I'll mention it. Okay. Um... So that, that, that's all we have. Uh, so thanks, Noam, thanks, Ross, and thanks, everyone, for attending um, today's webinar. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we'd appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours uh, with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of Pentland Medical and our presenters, thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, Cheers. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.